You know, one of the biggest challenges that we face in software is a digital transformation. Getting people who are using a manual method for what they're doing in their jobs to now using your platform, your software. It can be very, very tough to get them to make that mental change to realize they need to do that and then to actually make the physical change to start doing it and not go back to their old ways. I am lucky that we had Paul McCarthy from SnapFix on the show. He came in and shared exactly how they did it to make sure that their market, who was very manual and had a lot of struggles with that, but they were very stuck with the manual, how they made that pivot to start using SnapFix, start using a digital application instead of their old manual ways. He talks a lot about how the company kind of overcame that and also how they pivoted during COVID and a lot of ways that they have grown because of some of the cool methods and, and tactics that they've used. I think you're really going to like this if you want to understand how to get your market to start using your product. Welcome to Sastery in the Making, the podcast that features the people who made the software world what it is today and the leaders who are shaping the future of technology. Here's your host, Matt Wallach. Hello and welcome to Sastery in the Making. Thank you very much for coming. I am delighted to have you here. This is Matt Wallach. I am your host and it is our mission on this show to help you grow and scale your software company so you can achieve new heights and get that incredible valuation you're looking for. I am really excited about today's show. I have Paul McCarthy with us today. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks a million, Matt. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to have you. Let me make sure everybody knows who you are, Paul. So Paul is the CEO and founder at SnapFix. He's always been involved in managing commercial and residential buildings as part of a family business. And now he's got SnapFix. And this thing's pretty cool. We're going to talk about it. But really, the vision of the company is to democratize the continuous improvement of the world's buildings, facilities, and equipment by allowing for better communication on projects and teams. I am excited to learn more about that. Once again, Paul, thanks for coming on the show. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. That introduction sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but I'll hopefully uh, simplify it and, and make it more visual for people during the during during the podcast. <laughs> I have no doubt that you will. But you know, kick us off. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing lately and what's coming up. Yeah, so um, I, I, I'll just pop back a little bit. So my my background is about 25 years in computer software development, and in parallel with that, as you mentioned, I've always been managing commercial and residential buildings as part of a family business. And about five years ago, um, I joke and, and tell people I had about 50 post-it notes stuck to my face with uh, with requests coming in on emails, post-it notes, voicemails, phone calls, people tapping me on the shoulder from you know tenants and and guests staying in the properties and me trying to relate those to the contractors to get things done. The common denominator at the middle was WhatsApp, and which is great for chat. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, platform for chat, but it's not. it was never built to kind of be a project management or getting things done solution. So I set about to use all of the principles of simplicity that people love in, in WhatsApp or Instagram or Snapchat and bring that into the B2B space. So I identified the traffic light as the global symbol for, of teamwork. So when something is in red, it needs to get done. When it's in yellow, it's in progress. When it's green, it's completed. So the combination of photos for communication and traffic lights for collaboration leads to a, uh, a very simple universal solution. That's fantastic. And so what types of teams are using this right now? I mean, it seems like it's, it's pretty universal within that you know, property management, but what exactly, who is doing it? So we decided to stress test SnapFix from day one. So we chose the hotel sector, Matt. And the hotels are obviously open 24-7. They have a large audience of multilingual staff and they demand high quality. So they're a great testing ground for a software like ours, which is a really, really important thing. When you, when you bring something to the market, you want people to really drive it hard. So they drove it really, really hard. And the... Yeah, I'll give you some examples. Um, somebody in the housekeeping team might spot a leaking tap in a room, for example, and he or she would just take a photo of the of the leaking tap, possibly open the front door of the room, take a photo of the room number. So that person has communicated the issue and the location just with two photos. It instantly appears to the maintenance and management team and they can prioritize it and progress it to completion. So we have many customers who are communicating and collaborating with minimal te text which is great for people where, let's say, English isn't their first language and, and written English would, would be even more of a challenge. 
Yeah, no kidding. I think that's amazing. I've worked in hotels. I was actually educated in hospitality management, no. and I've seen some of those exact challenges you're saying. And you're right. You're throwing it, throwing that application to the wolves going into hotels. I mean, it absolutely has <laughs> to be great and dynamic. So what a testing ground. How did that go? They were great. Well, we kicked off kind of officially in September 19 and hotels were absolutely rocking up until the middle of March uh, 2020 when we all know what happened then. <laughs> and um, we had planned on staying absolutely focused in, in hotels for about two years. But we at, in the middle of March 2020, when COVID hit, we went we went broad to the rest of um, the offices and facilities management um, type buildings. So offices, apartment buildings, factories, retail, um, construction companies, engineering. We even have mines using using Snapfix. So we, we, we wanted to prove it initially that it was a universal solution. Um, but COVID kind of accelerated that quite a bit. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. And I know a lot of people out there who are starting software companies, a lot of them listen to this show. They they know that they need to kind of niche down and find that kind of segment that they can really focus on. But then they also have those goals of getting out wide and starting to go go after some other nearby verticals. It sounds like you did that. Can you explain a little bit about how that process went for you? Kind of the good and bad of you started that niche with hotels and then you kind of went after more. I agree. The um, focusing on a niche is actually probably the the, the number one priority of a of, 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 of a of a SaaS company. It's really really important to um, to to build something that people want, which is which is what uh, Paul Graham from Y Combinator is always preaching, um, and to get it into customers' hands as quickly as possible. Because what you've designed around the boardroom table or or, or huddling with your team can be very different to the actual customer experience. So you want to iterate and um, and improve that as quickly as possible. Um, I'd be a big fan of um, staying focused on the niche and uh, winning the niche and then broaden out from there. Even take some extra time to really, really, you know, rock it in that niche. Yeah, and I completely agree. I think it's great. Obviously, there are other factors that play for you guys, but in a perfect world, it makes it easier to focus your product to align with what they need. It makes it easier to get your marketing messaging lined up to what's good for them. It makes it easier to get your sales process in sync with with their workflow. So I, I think in general, it's it's the right way to do it. Unfortunately, you know, obviously <laughs> things happened when when you guys were doing that. But how has it been trying to get development, marketing, sales? to all kind of work for different industries. Has that been okay? Uh, we have a few golden rules in, in Snapfix, Matt. One is everything we do in, in the product has to be simple and universal. So we take a lot of time in the design stage. And as everybody knows, if you get the design right, development is a lot easier, testing is a lot easier, and the maintenance of your software going forward is a lot easier. So we're very, very, very focused on getting the design right up front. The analogy I use with everybody is, is and I have nothing against Microsoft, but it's Microsoft Word. We all pay for 100% of Microsoft Word. We use 1% of it. So at Snapfix, we're just focused on that 1% that everybody will use or the vast majority of our customers will use. Um, on the marketing side, just getting the word out. Of course, during COVID, it was a challenge. It was B2B sales, so bedroom to bedroom sales. We were in our bedrooms, they were in their bedrooms, and, uh, and we're still trans we're still transacting. Um, and so getting the word out has been great. It was wonderful about six months ago to go to the high tech event in Orlando and to see everybody came back. Now, COVID wasn't over yet, and there were still, I met some people there who actually had COVID or caught COVID around that time, but um, it's great to see that that's kind of dissipated now as well. But it's great to see events back. So we're getting a lot of traction um, at uh, hospitality and facilities management events as well. That's fantastic. I think events are really a, a key you know, piece of the puzzle when it comes to go-to-market strategy, and a lot of people can do very well at events. Uh, that's something I've always had good success with, with our teams. You definitely have to know how to, how to do it, but events are great. And I agree. I'm glad that they're, they're coming back now. It's good to see. It was very stressful, maybe for the six weeks before at hand, because you're thinking, are people going to turn up at this event? And it was slammed. It was fantastic. It was great. Yeah. I, I, I kind of think the, the attendance numbers are swelled at live events right now because people are <laughs> yeah. so sick of not being out and about They're They're ready to get out there. I did a um, we did an event in New York about six weeks ago in early November, and um, it was the Propel event in the Jacob Javits Center on the on the west side, 
and that was so well attended it was fantastic got an opportunity to speak at that as well which which was great and i would encourage any new founders or, or any people developing a solution get up on stage and tell people about about your mission and what you're trying to do and um and we got a lot of great contacts from that that's fantastic. That's actually something I teach my clients. Yeah, go to an event, go to a conference. And of course, if you want to exhibit, exhibit, and there's certain ways to do it. But if you really want to build trust within your industry and show yourself as kind of that that leader within your industry, speak at the event yeah. and put your application in. You have to do it sometimes really early to do it. But when you're up on stage, people view you in a different light and they start to gain much more respect for you. It's really, really cool what can happen. You can drive a lot of business from doing that. So I'm glad you did that, Paul. Absolutely. And I, and I think one thing I learned a couple of years ago, when you do when you do speak at events like that, you're not selling your product. You're talking about where the industry is going. And in, in this case, I was I was t talking to everybody about the power of the of the smartphone and the smartphone People with smartphones equals smart building. So with the devices and the camera about to 10x, you know, in the next 10 years in, uh, in, the, in both the camera and the phone, we're going to have incredible power to, to allow everybody in a building to contribute to the well-being of that building at all times. So imagine walking into a building tomorrow, you're essentially walking into a, a virtual group with every, every other occupant of that building and the devices on your phone and, and the ability for you to be able to use photos to report things um, in a collaborative way is a, is, a, is a key part of the smart building future, I believe. I think that's genius. I never thought of it that way. You have these really old buildings that might seem difficult to kind of retrofit and get up to date yep. and make make them quote unquote smart. I kind of relate it to like an old TV. If you take a, a Google Chromecast or an Amazon Fire Stick, you can plug it in and now it becomes a smart TV just by doing that. Yep. Yep. I love this idea, Paul, that, hey, with everybody who's in the building, especially like a hotel with the workers or maybe a, a commercial building with some maintenance staff, everybody has those smartphones. So now it becomes a smart building. They can use their snap fix. They can jump in, take the photos of what they need to fix. That sounds amazing. It is cool. And if you can imagine, Matt, the, um, the phones of the future will have air quality you know, sensors. It'll have temperature sensors. It'll have um, barometric pressure sensors, everything like that. Today, we capture photos and GPS location. In 10 years' time, we're going to be catch capturing the wealth of information, again, which can be used to, to, um, to help the facilities manager or the property manager to make better decisions about their building. Yeah, it's, I, I think that's fantastic. And you talked earlier about how they need to be using this, and it's so much easier. You've got a housekeeper who sees a toilet that's broken, they you know, snap a picture. But a lot of your industry, a lot of the people you're targeting, were doing things manually prior to this. And this is very common with a lot of software platforms out there. You created a great product, and you're going after people who were doing things a completely different way, not using software. So what did you guys do? How did you get your targets? How did you get your market to shift and change and decide that they should start using a platform for this? Okay, a few, a few, a few key points there. And that's a really great question, Matt. Um, people are emotionally attached to, to Instagram. They're emotionally attached to Snapchat and, and to TikTok and to WhatsApp and these types of platforms. We, we, we use that as our focus and our starting point. So everything in Snapfix starts with a photo. And everything has to be camera roll simple is the term I use with the team. Um, and and we, we want to, to make Snapfix an emotionally relevant product in a B2B space. It should, be, it should be so easy to use and also give you such a great sense of satisfaction when you're using it. You're, you're moving stuff from red to yellow to green and, and, and you get a little dopamine hit and you're, you're, you're happy that you've, you, that, 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 you, that you've got something done. And of course, there's a lot of data analytics and reporting and dashboards. You can see progress and everything like that. So that's, um, that's one key part of us and staying I did a lot of study um, around how um, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive designed the iPod and the iPhone, and they had an approach where they they ruthlessly eliminated everything that wasn't absolutely essential in a product, and they kept looking at it and iterating and iterating and shaving it and paring it down until it was absolutely absolutely minimalistic, and that's the 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 other side of it. So design, getting the design right, is key. And then iterating, and in fact, our product manager is instructed to remove 10% of Snapfix every year. So we analyze what people are using, 
and the bottom 10%, we just slide it out because it's being minimally used or are not used. And then we're not wow. carrying and then we're not carrying what they call technical debt forward. You don't want to be maintaining 10% of your solution for years to, to come if no one's if, if no one's using it. I was just going to ask. I'm sure that really helps with technical debt and making sure that you don't have to have a team of 20 guys or 20 engineers who are just managing something just to try and keep it alive. And that's a lot of expense. That's a lot of time wasted. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. I think that's smart. Where did, where did you come up with that strategy? Um, I think it was it was it was really doing a lot of study around how the guys in Apple, you know, reinvented Apple. Like it's when when Steve Jobs came back in back in I think it was in 1997, and they had 40 products, and he went to a whiteboard and he drew a um, a quadrant, and he said from now on we're going to have four products, you know, two for business, two for two for the consumer, and one one desktop, one laptop in in each of those areas. And he, he canned everything else. And it was a relentless focus around making those products the best they can be for those audiences. And now you see where, where, where they took it. It's hard. It's hard to say no. If I was showing you my office desk now, the, um, the poster I have on, on the wall of my office is no. So we start with no, which, which unfortunately, not fortunately, but fortunately for us, the competition very often starts with yes. And they load their software with features and nobody it's this it isn't about features it's about usability wow that's cool i love that it's a great model tell me about a time as you guys were getting going that uh you experienced some difficulties and things didn't quite go right or maybe there were some mistakes made what what happened and i know we talked about covid but aside from that what happened and how did you guys overcome that how did you you beat that um, well, well, the one that immediately comes to mind was uh, it's like March 15th when COVID happened. I actually cried that day. You know, we had we had gone all in on on hotels, and I shed a tear in a meeting because we had to let some people go, and we just saw the writing on the wall. So that that was tough, but it was the right decision to do. We gave ourselves 24 hours to be upset, and then we just got back in and put our seatbelts on and just drove on and globally and and and, and sectorally. Um, other other um, other examples of where we would have made some mistakes was during COVID, we tried to pivot a little bit to solve some of the COVID problems, um, mainly around um, intensive cleaning and things like that in, uh, in hotels, which was a great idea, but it was hard to roll out because we were trying to roll it out remotely. Again, I mentioned B2B, bedroom to bedroom sales. It was just... If I if I had had that time again, I wouldn't have gone down that road. I'd have stuck mm. to the focus that we had. We wanted to add on a, a kind of a COVID module at the side, and of course, it's not relevant anymore anyway. So um, we probably strayed a little bit, but we got back on track pretty quick. Good, good. That's awesome. I'm glad you figured that out and got back to where you need to be. What about some of the good things? What were some of the best moves you guys made that helped the company accelerate forward? Um, hands down, I think from day one, Matt was choosing um, a co-founder. So my co-founder, his name is Cahill Greeny. He's our CTO. I met maybe 10 companies before I met Cahill. And we, 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 were, we were introduced. And literally, when I started talking to him about what I was hoping to build or aiming to build, he, he nearly took the sentences out of, out of my mouth and saying, oh, okay, so we're talking about a, a, an AWS infrastructure globally where we're synchronizing data between Android and iOS. And, and he just kept going with it. And I was thinking, and then he was mentioning stuff that I hadn't even thought about. So I was like, my, this, is, this is my guy. So finding the right co-founder is hands down the most important thing because we're married now. My wife looks at me as if I'm having an affair with Snapfix and, and everything. So it's uh, it's when you're all in, you got you got to be working with people you respect, and and who are also all in. And and it's and it's a pleasure to work with with somebody like that every single day. Um, the other lessons would be just getting the product right. You know, design the product and then cut it in half and then design that and then cut it in half. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in simplicity and get that and get that part of it right. And now customers today are asking us for a little more and a little more. And now is the time to do it. Whereas there was no point in building it theoretically three years ago or two years ago. We're building it now based on being customer driven or they're pulling us forward. 
I love that. It's not something you just thought maybe this will work. It's now something that the market and your customers are telling you this is what we need. And the, the one piece of advice I'd give everybody uh, uh, listening to your podcast would be to read as much as you can about um, Paul Graham's letters from Y Combinator. He's got an amazing blog. I think it's paulgraham.com. And he's also featured on the Founders, um, the Founders podcast. And the advice he gives is, is just amazing. He's funded, I don't know, two or two and a half thousand startups. So he sees what works all along the way. And the key messages are the same, you know, make sure you make sure you and your co-founders are, are, are really tight together and then build something that people want and get it in front of customers and get real customer feedback real fast. And it's okay to do things that, that don't scale in the beginning. You know, early um, before COVID, I was driving around to hotels, showing it to them. You know, just cajoling them, getting them to uh, to, um, to to uh, to to try Snapfix. Now we have people finding it on the App Store, downloading it, and using it, and never speaking to us. So it's wow. it's okay to do stuff that uh, that doesn't scale in the early days. I think that's that's smart advice. I've seen that as well, and with my own companies, I've done that too. Early days, sometimes you spend a little more time than you will in the in the future, and a lot of times we overthink scale early. But you can get there once you figure out exactly who your customer is and how to take the care of them best. So I, I love that advice, Paul. And and it's cool to listen to podcasts around like the founders of Airbnb. They they drove to people's apartments and took better photos. So they figured out that better photos equals better representation on the Airbnb website more more eyeballs on it and then the word spread so they've been from 50 apartments to 100 to 200 and allowed them to to grow but you got to do the heavy lifting yourself on day one great advice i love that well this has been fantastic paul thank you for coming on the show and sharing all of this amazing wisdom i love hearing the story of how snapfix came to be and what is good and bad for you guys how can our audience learn more about you and snapfix um, we'd love to talk to any of your listeners who are who have uh, buildings, infrastructure, or equipment that needs uh, some maintenance using a simple system. And we're on snapfix.com. And my my direct email is paul at snapfix.com if you want to ping me a note. Okay, perfect. We'll put all that into the show notes as well. For anybody out there, you'll be able to see all that in there. Paul, this is awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks a million, Matt. Really, really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you for inviting me on. Oh, absolutely. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. And everybody else out there, thank you for listening. Thanks for watching. It's been great having you here. Now, make sure you are subscribed to the show. Hit that subscribe button. And if you think this is great stuff, rate us. That would really help me understand, hey, we're giving you the best possible stuff. So please go ahead and rate the show. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Take care.